so yeah, I'm a neuroscientist, and what that means is that I spend my day sort of fascinated by and studying this thing right here is the, the brain. And like my colleague neuroscientists, I spent uh, many, many years toiling away in my master's, I mean PI's lab at the university across the street, just to get access to the tools to understand how the brain works, right? It's about $40,000 worth of equipment uh, to be able to understand how the brain works. And so to me, that seemed like a shame um, because one out of five people, that's 20% of the entire world has a neurological disorder. And how many cures do we have for neurological diseases? None, right? Infamously. Um, and so that seems a bit weird that the only way to understand how the brain works is to dedicate your life to that, even though it's a huge problem for humanity, right? And so when I was in grad school, uh, my lab mate, uh, Tim Marzullo and myself decided, you know, there's, this is not good, right? There's other branches of science where they've solved this, right? So you don't have to get a PhD in astrophysics to get access to a telescope, right? You can just go to a store and, and buy a cheap one and set it up in your backyard and maybe you become interested in becoming a scientist in the future or even uh, an astronomer, right? But there's nothing like that in biology or in specifically in, in neuroscience. And so uh, we decided to change that. So we created something which we call the spiker box. And what this is, is like a, a telescope, but instead of for outer space, it's for inner space, right? It's gonna be able to, a cheap device that's gonna be able to record uh, the inner workings of the brain, and then we've designed it so that it'd be useful in the classrooms. We can start early, around fifth grade, and start to work the way through high schools to get people interested in becoming neuroscientists when they grow up, because that's what we need to sort of fight these problems, right? Uh, and so what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be doing some demonstrations of, of this technology. I'm going to sort of show you how the brain works, okay? Uh, at the door to do that, I'm going to do a little bit of background. because I'm not so sure how many people are neuroscientists here, so I'm just going to just briefly describe the brain. Um, and, and I can't really describe what it does, kind of does everything. It's, it's, uh, it's sort of controlling us. It's sort of uh, taking the percept of who I am. You're listening to my voice and the, and the visuals. It's all coming together in your consciousness through information. The information gets passed through cells, just like we're made out of cells. The entire body, the brain is made out of cells as well. Uh, these cells in the brain are special. They have, uh, they have these things called processes that reach out, and they have long ones called an axon, and it's down this axon that the information is passed. How does it get passed? Using electricity. Why electricity? Because it's fast. You need to be able to react quickly. And so uh, what we're going to be looking at today is how does that information get passed? And so we're going to be looking at something called the spike, and if you learn anything today, I want you to remember the action potential, or spike, is the way information gets passed in your brain. We're gonna be doing some experiments live on stage where we're gonna to try to record living neural tissue and be able to record these guys. Um, so we don't have batteries in our, in our bodies, we have uh, little chemicals, and if you remember from chemistry class, little pluses and minuses, those are called ions, and the, the, there's the little gates that open and close, just like a transistor, uh, inside the living tissue of the neurons that allow this electrical message to pass and it goes from one cell, impossibly close to another one through a synapse where a chemical message is passed, but then that creates a spike of the next neuron, and then each one of these spikes sort of is passing information, and the information comes together into this process called consciousness, which we don't quite understand how that works yet, but we are slowly working on that, uh, to then you know, send commands out to your muscles to make you move around. And so what I'll be doing today is doing a live uh, demonstration, but I'm not gonna record from my brain, I'm gonna be recording from the brains of these guys here. So I brought with me some blabberous discoitus. These are sort of large cockroaches that come from uh, you know, South America. And I'm gonna be recording from their brains. And I just wanna do, say one quick thing about this guy because there are, um, a lot of people hate cockroaches, and I'm here today to sort of solve that problem, you know, rescue them back, because there are a lot of insects we do love. We love butterflies, we love dragonflies, ladybugs, you know, there's certain things that we would catch and bring in and show people, but the poor cockroach is so vilified, right? So we are gonna uh, sort of rescue that, and I'm gonna tell you that uh, they're not much different than us. So about a half a billion years ago, 500 million years ago, uh, the, there's a, a ball and a stick, a, you know, a brain and a spinal cord. They have a ventral nerve cord. But, uh, but the actual neurons themselves inside the cockroach and the humans are very similar. Uh, they have about a million, and we have about 180 billion, so we have more. But the, each neuron themselves are roughly the same. So what we're going to be doing now 
is I'm going to uh, uh, do a surgery on this cockroach. I'm going to anesthetize him. So I'm going to take some, uh, a glass of ice water here, and I'll bring this back up. And I'm going to put the cockroach inside the ice water. And what's going to happen is that the, uh, so unlike us, we are what's called uh, endothermic, be warm-blooded. These guys are cold-blooded. So if I take a cockroach and I stick into ice water, what's going to happen is that he's going to quickly become ah, the same temperature as that ice water, okay? And then what happens when things get cold? Uh, things slow down, and so those little ion channels are going to stop moving, and when the ion channels stop moving, the spikes are going to stop firing, and when spikes stops firing, uh, he can no longer move, and he can no longer feel pain, right? So we're going to be able to uh, do a surgery. And I just want to talk about this for just one second. The, uh, when we're working with cockroaches in, 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 in science, when we do animal experiments, we have to kind of weigh out the pros and cons. So what are the, uh, the cost to the animal versus what is the benefit to society? I talked about the benefit society that, you know, 20% of the world has no logic disorder, no cures. What's the cost of the roach? So I'm going to be removing, removing one of his legs in just a second. But I just want to tell you that these legs can regrow. So this is a, published, uh, a paper we published a few years ago that shows a, a leg that we removed on the right-hand side has been uh, sort of growing back. And then you can see it again 125 days later. It's back to news. It's kind of a green process. He's going to regrow. So we think that the benefit uh, to society is high and the cost to the animal is low. We can also measure what it eats and what it does. Uh, and it's roughly the same. So we don't think there's much of a, 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 a cost to the animal. Um, and so what we're going to do is uh, do a small surgery. And before I, mean, before I go into the surgery, I'm going to take some what we're going to do. I'm going to record from the neurons in its legs. And so this is going to be like if someone touches in your back, how do you know you get, someone got touched in the back? You have a neuron there sending a message to your brain. So we're going to record that message from the cockroach leg's hair that when it gets touched, it's going to be able to send that message to the brain. And so I'm going to remove the leg right now. And then I'm going to amplify the electrical messages that are going to go through there. So I'll take this guy out, and then I'm going to take a pair of scissors, and I'm just going to cut him off right here. And so even though it looks like he's not alive, he is alive. He's just his neurons have shut down. So what I'm going to do is I have to remove this leg, and then I'm going to warm up his leg. I'm going to put him back in here to kind of recover. And then I'm going to stick some electrodes into the leg to record the electrical activity of the neurons that are passing by. All right? This is back here. So uh, electricity likes to flow up metal, and so these are two metal pins. I'm going to put two metal pins in here. Why two? Because you need a plus and minus. It's in reference to something. So I'll stick this guy in there, and I'll stick this guy into there. So now I've got two pins in there. Let me see, zoom in a little bit more. And now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn on the amplifier. This is like it's going to make things, the, the electricity, a little bit louder. So I'm going to turn this on. And we're going to listen to what the cockroach can sound like when I touch this, it tears. Hold my, my phone. Can everyone listen to this? Did everyone hear that? People say that sounds like raindrops. But what you're listening to is the action potential, the spike. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plug this guy in, and we are careful scientists here at Tech Trek. So I'm going to plug this in, and we're going to be able to see what those spikes look like. So I'm going to bring this up here. I'm going to touch these legs again. And so I'm going to put a little threshold. It goes by really fast. So these, these are about a millisecond one thousandth of a second wide. So I'm going to pause it for just for a second. And we're going to take a look. Ooh, that's beautiful. You guys hear that? So now I'm going to zoom in on that. And there we see the axe potential. There's a, an implosion of sodium replaced by potassium and going back down. So this is the information. So if I, if I were to touch it very lightly, you get a few spikes. If I touch it a little bit harder, you get more spikes. And this is how information gets processed in the brain, all right? So we are developing this technology to sort of allow students to be able to understand how the brain works and get an idea of what's called rate coding. It took us about 50 years in neuroscience to be able to do this, but we're going to do it live on stage, and students are able to do that starting in fifth grade and on up. And so we've, 
I've had a few more experiments, but I, uh, I'm going to pause these for now. I'm going to tell you, if you're interested in this, uh, we are um, based here in Ann Arbor. Uh, we're Backyard Brains, and we have a book coming out in 10 days. It will be available uh, from MIT Press and uh, published by Penguin Random House. So if you're interested in this, uh, you can pick this up, and you'll be able to do about 50 more of these experiments and understand exactly how the brain works. Thank you so much.